before we go to the Lord's scriptures today, we'll be in John 5, by the way. Before we do that, please join me again in prayer. Father, we thank you for your holy scriptures, breathed out by you, protected by you, given to us by you. And Lord, they are inerrant. They are all sufficient for us to be able to live a life pleasing to you. We thank you for that. We ask that by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate your word to us, that you would help us to be able to understand it better, that you'd give us wisdom in your word, according to James 1.5, and that you would help us to be hearers of the word, but doers also. Bring it to our remembrance when we need it most, when we need to be remembered as we're being tempted, or when we need to be convicted or something, or when we need courage to be able to share the gospel or to be able to stand for you and your word. Bring it to our remembrance. We ask that you would bless our time together in your word today, in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Be seated. Now is uh, John 5, part 1. This is Jesus returning to Jerusalem for another festival. We don't know exactly which festival, but he heals a lame man on the Sabbath day. And the religious leaders and in Jerusalem are more concerned with the man carrying his mat on the Sabbath day than with this miraculous healing that has happened. Uh, this is where we start to see even more clearly an opposition form against Christ. There's always been opposition against him seemingly, but this is where it really starts to show its face. We go to verse 1 in John 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now in some of your Bibles you will have a verse 4, and in some of them you will not. I will get to that in a second, but uh, just so for context here, verse 4 for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever diseases he had. So when the water started to move, oh, it must be an angel moving the water. Quick, first one in is the one who gets the healing. So, right, you can maybe see and understand why that would not be included in some uh, Bible translations because, well, we'll get into that. But first I want to say that it mentions that Jesus goes to Jerusalem because there's a feast. We don't know which feast this was. It's just a feast. It's probably one of the major feasts, though, because um, major feasts were the ones that everybody was required to go to. So we can surmise that much. You can also find that there has been an excavation in the area just north of the temple area that found a pool that matches the description here in John 5 with five porches, just like John describes. We mentioned in verse 2, the sheep gate. Uh, that is a reference to the area, the specific area. This is also mentioned in Nehemiah. It's a small opening in the north wall of the city. It's in the northeast corner. There is a pool. And some, some people look at this and say, well, why is verse 4 not there? Well, before we get to that, Bethesda is, means a house of outpouring. So you can see how this, this name, Bethesda, ties in with this pool, with this somewhat strange idea that if you see the water trembling, an angel must have come down, and this is God's way of healing. When in, almost like a custom, almost like a, uh, almost like a tradition, or like an old wives' tale. Oh, get in there and do that, because the water's troubled, you'll be healed. In truth, there's intermittent springs that would feed this pool and would cause the water to be disturbed. Some ancient witnesses talk about how the pool was red with minerals, and so because it had a different color than the water around, it would be considered medicinal. And you can see that, right? We see that all the time, that just little things here and there, people will take and run with it and turn it into something more than what it really is. So you have all these people who are waiting by the waters, um, the early manuscripts as well as early versions of the scriptures exclude this reading, which is why it's not in what we read from the ESV, or it's not in the NSAB either. And so that's because it's not there in the earliest manuscripts. The other reason it's not there is because it's not really something that is in line with what God really does, right? 
Uh, the fountain of youth, is that real? You've got all kinds of hearsay about it. But is it real? Is that how God gives eternal life through the fountain of youth somewhere down in the swamps of Florida? You've got to fight a python for it? No, it's just hearsay. Wives' tales. The idea was that an angel would come down and, and stir the well, just pink, right? Little angel, chubby angel, big diaper, right? No shirt, comes down, touches the water, rustles. And if you're the first one in that water, oh. So your hope of healing is in this, right? And this angel coming down, touching the pool. This is probably just a hopeful legend like so many other things. But... Like in so many ways, many people put their hope in hopeful legends. You're sick, you feel bad, well, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Sounds crazy, but I'm tired of being sick, so I'm going to go down to that pool anyway. This is, this is not found in the old manuscripts. This is, again, just legend, legend, an old saying. In comparison to what Christ is about to do, which is the real deal, the real thing. Not some hopeful legend, but the real deal. John 5, verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Don't read past that. 38 years! That is kind of a long time. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, Jesus said to him, do you want to be healed? This man suffered from this condition for 38 years. He was a, a frequent visitor to the pool, frequently going there in the hope of being healed. Why are we? Nothing is added to the Bible without reason, right? If God breathed it out, God doesn't just throw something in there and be like, well, whatever, we could just throw that 38 years in there, whatever. It could be 32, 38, 5, 6, whatever. Why are we given that specific date, that specific number of years? Well, to tell us that this man's condition was real. There's no, he hadn't just suffered it for six months. He hadn't just had it for a year or two. It could not be disputed. His suffering could not be disputed, which is important for when Jesus does something about it. Because then that gives, it lends its credibility because this man had a debilitating disease for 38 years, and then someone, Jesus, comes and does something about it. You see how that would lend credibility to Jesus. This man's sickness had been witnessed for 30 plus years. So when Jesus healed him, everybody knew that it was a genuine healing, because you're not going to fake it for 38 years, right? It's not like 38 years earlier, Jesus came to the guy and said, look, in 38 years from now, I'm going to come here, you're going to be at the pool, and we're going to pull off this awesome, awesome fake stunt. Right? Of course not. So again, it lends credibility to Christ. Jesus selects this man among the great multitude of sick people who are hanging out by this pool. Jesus knew Everything about this man. He has supernatural knowledge about this man's condition, his situation, everything about him. And Jesus picks him. Why? Because well, he's sovereign. Because <laughs> he's sovereign. Because God the Father's sovereign. It was God's will to choose him. There's no reason given. And God doesn't need to give you a reason. He doesn't need an answer to me or you. God just chose this man. It was God's sovereign choice. He has that right. We, sometimes our stubborn will doesn't like hearing that, but it's the truth. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. Heal who he wants. There was a multitude of needy people there, but none of them were looking to Jesus. When Jesus came up, none of them stopped what they were doing and went, oh, Jesus. None of them had the reaction of the Samaritan people after hearing from the Samaritan woman. None of them came and said, you are the Savior of the world. Oh, Jesus. None of them came running to Jesus. None of them. They, it was almost as if they were blind, spiritually blind, sitting at that pool, putting their hope in some urban legend instead of Christ, who was standing right there. The one person who could heal them is standing right there, but spiritually blinded, they don't look to him. They continue to look at this false hope. Oh, it sounds a lot like 
today, doesn't it? There's many people who Christ is right there, but instead of looking to Him, they look at other things in false hope. Instead of seeking Him. Their eyes were fixed on the water. They're too busy, right? Because if, if, if the time that you need to jump in the water is when the water starts to move, well, you better be paying attention to the water because it only works for the first person who gets in the water, supposedly. And that's just a mixture for, for all kinds of trouble, isn't it? Because, well, who got in first? Well, I thought it was Billy. Well, I don't know. I thought Sean got in first. I don't know. Which one of us is supposed to be healed? I don't know. Neither of us are healed. Well, we, neither of us should have got in at the same time. It was a tie, so it just totally blew everything out. Now we've got to wait for the next time it troubles the water. How stupid. But we follow those things. Jesus asks this man a simple question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? This is a real question. Jesus knew that not every sick person wants to be healed. Some are so discouraged that they put away all hope from being healed. Sometimes you find that in the, in the homeless community, that some people don't want to be given a home. Some people don't want to be helped out of homelessness. Some people are so comfortable with it that they don't want to be disturbed out of it. I've seen that firsthand where people will choose to be homeless, even given the option for a hand up and out of that situation. They choose to stay in it. Jesus attempts to build faith in this man. You remember last time we talked about the nobleman and how he's pleading Jesus to heal his son, right? And Jesus can heal his son, no problem. But Jesus doesn't just take what the guy is asking for and do it and then go about his business. Jesus looks to the man's greater need, which is his own faith. And so Jesus builds the faith in this noble man, right? We see that by his response to Jesus, saying, your son is well, go. And what's the guy do? The guy who's been pleading with Jesus over and over and over again, what's he do? He goes. He exercises his faith. He shows that his faith is genuine, not just his profession of faith, but that there's action behind it. He goes, and he doesn't just run home to see if Jesus was telling the truth. He casually starts heading home, and he's told by his servants who meet him there halfway that his son is made well. And then him and his whole family come to faith. Greater, he comes to greater faith, and then that turns into faith in the rest of his family as well. So in the same way that Jesus heals the son, but he's also building the faith of that nobleman, Jesus is going to not just heal this man at the pool, he's going to build his faith. Jesus isn't just going to meet his felt need he goes to the heart. What's the most important need of all? Your spiritual condition. What good does it do if Jesus heals this man, but leaves his soul condemned to hell? So Jesus is going to build faith in this man and through this man. In this man's particular case, it's reasonable to wonder if he really wanted to be healed. I don't know if he really wanted to be healed or if he didn't really want to be healed. Some people who are, you know, made a good living by sitting out next to the pool, putting out their arms. I don't want to work, but if I sit here long enough and look pitiful enough, people will just throw money at my feet. There's people who stand on corners, you know, especially uh, busy intersections and stuff who do that very thing. The man replies to Jesus in verse 7. The sick man answers him and says, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. And now that day was the Sabbath. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. The crippled man assumes Jesus knew how things worked at this pool, right? And he explained to Jesus why it's not possible for him to be healed. Look, he doesn't say he'd like to be healed, but he goes, look, the problem is, is that I can't get in the pool fast enough. I'm trying, no one helps me in, and because I'm so slow in getting in, somebody else always beats me into it. He, funny how he's not even thinking about any other way of, of his healing being done. All he can focus on is the fact that, look, I just can't get into the pool fast enough. If I had enough people to help me, if I... Uh, a little bit of hope, a little bit of hopelessness. Eh. There was a little bit of hope because otherwise you don't go to the pool, right? 
but hopelessness in the fact that even though he's at the pool, no one helps him in. He'll never get in first. He'll never find the healing that he seems to possibly want. He's putting what little hope he had, he's putting in the wrong direction. But Jesus is about to fix that. The man's answer, he says, another steps down before me. This is just propagating that urban legend that it has to be whoever steps in immediately after the stirring of the water is the one who is made whole or, or healed. Calvin had this quote. He said, the sick man does not does what we really nearly all do. He limits God's help to his own ideas. And he does not dare promise himself more than he conceives in his mind. Isn't that true? The sick man can, can only think about, well, there's only one way. So you put God in a box. Because you can't, you can't help but limit God to what you can conceive and what your ideas have. This man was no different. He didn't even know he was speaking to Christ. Jesus now speaks, and Jesus told the man to do something that he could not do. Right? Tells him to do something he can't physically do. This is a very quick conversation. This was not some two-hour long journey. This is no three-hour tour like Gilligan's Island. This is a quick conversation. In the midst of this quick conversation, Jesus tells the man to do something that is impossible for him to do. Uh, strange, right? Would you do that? <laughs> you know, Would you go to the infirmary and tell somebody who's all in a body cast to get up and walk? You, Hi, my name's Michael. Hi, I'm Steve. Hi, Steve. Nice to meet you. Uh, would you like to be healed? Sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, no, I can't get in the pool fast enough. Uh, da, da, da. Get up and walk. Strange. Odd. Rise up. Take your bed and walk. This man's paralyzed. It's impossible for him to rise. It's impossible to take up his bed. It's impossible for him to walk. Yet this is exactly what Jesus tells him to do. At this moment Jesus is challenging the man to believe in him for something that is impossible not the pool because he's not asking the man to get in the pool he's asking the man to believe in him albeit in a way that is strange to us but that is what Jesus is doing he's not saying get in the pool or I'll help you in the pool He's not saying to do anything else. He's challenging the man to believe in him for the impossible and not anything else, just in him, just in the words that are coming out of his mouth. Believe in Jesus to be made well. Don't believe in all this other junk. Don't believe in the fact that you have to be able to get into the pool and you have to be able to do, you have to, you have to, works-based theology, works-based theology. Just believe in Jesus and be made well. Well, do you see the spiritual foreshadowing here? This is a bed mat. This isn't some Tempur-Pedic, right? It's not some, uh, he's not got a soft number that he's trying to tick on. This is like a rolling mat, straw, light enough that you could carry it around. He says, get up. In the same way that Jesus who is the creator of all things, used his words to create everything around us. He tells this man, get up, take up your mat, walk. This isn't just you or me saying this. This is the creator of all things, who's in his very mouth, his words contain power unimaginable. He's the one telling this man to do this. It's a unique situation, to be sure. The man picks up his bed and begins to walk. When, when God heals somebody, he doesn't do it in part measure. Okay? Physically, when he heals people as evidence of his supreme deity and his evidence of who he is being genuine, when he heals people, they're healed. It's not, and Jesus spoke to Billy, and Billy's sore ankle was a little better. No. Uh, Jesus spoke to Timmy, and Timmy's uh, wrist was slightly 10% more mobile than it was before. Praise God. No. No, this is the, that would be weak, right? 
If that's the only kind of healing this God can do, what a weak God. If he's God, then it's, why can't he? If he breathed and spoke the universe into creation, he can't heal a sore wrist, he can't heal an ankle, he can't tell an invalid to get up and walk. But that is exactly what Jesus does. Tells him to get up and walk. The completeness of his healing is evident immediately. Immediately, because guess what? The man doesn't go, well, I can only get up part way. Uh, tell me again that I need to... No, it's immediate. Immediate and full. Just emphasizing the, the genuineness of Jesus as, as God, as creator God, and that he is all-powerful. His cure was complete. And if you can understand how Jesus heals completely when he does here physically, without the man's help, without the man doing anything but believing what Jesus said, he was cured, healed. Not just kind of healed, but completely cured and healed. If you can understand that, now take that to the spiritual realm and understand salvation. That in salvation, Christ is asking you to just believe what he says. Believe in who he is. And that he will cure you spiritually, completely. He doesn't need your help. He does the curing completely in and of himself by his own power. All you have to do is believe. Right? Do you see? This is no man-made book. Nobody's wise enough. No, no gathering of people are wise enough to make those kind of connections over and over through the Old Testament and the New Testament like that. Airtight. That the same way that he heals physically is the same way he heals spiritually. So get out of here with the fact that, well, you know, yeah, I have to do this and I have to do that, or I'm only half saved. Get out of here. Jesus does nothing halfway. God does nothing halfway. He do, what he does, he does in completeness and in perfection. That includes salvation. It's easy to imagine that this man's first reaction was, huh? Right? Huh? Yet something prompted him, something prompted him to say, I will try. What this man says, uh, he, he responds in faith. Something made that happen. It was Jesus. Jesus. And boy, the same foreshadowing there for the spiritual sense. That, that what causes someone to respond to Jesus in faith? Je God, Jesus does. Who, what, what makes somebody want, you know, able to hear the call and want to come to it? God. John 6, 44, right? No one can come to the Father unless the Father draws them to himself. Or Matthew 13, right? That you have been given ears to hear and eyes to see. It's, it's all of God. He's commanded to take up his bed and walk. You can't do that if you're only half cured. This is to show that the cure is full and, and, and permanent. I'm sure that it, that it was also to be sure that you have all this pool going on, all this fake healing going on. Billy gets in the pool and, oh, I do feel better, right? Think of every uh, Benny Hinn uh, event. Come up and, whew, oh. And then for the next 30 minutes, oh, I do feel better. Oh, I do feel like I, oh, hey, yeah. Right? And then 30 minutes go by, the event is over, you're walking out to your car and you're like, oh, oh, oh my back, oh. Or you go to the doctor and you're like, hey, I was healed of my cancer. And the doctor does a bunch of checks and says, I'm sorry, you're not. Right? Fake healings, all this stuff. Imagine all the fake healings that happened at that pool. And then you have the real deal come and happen. Right? Jesus heals this man completely. He gets up, grabs his bed, walks. Man who's been invalid for 38 years. Now, Jesus doesn't do things halfway. He didn't come up and be like, oh, what would be the easiest guy to heal? Oh, uh, you got a sliver in your finger? Hey, come on over here. No. Immediately, the man was made well. He responds to Jesus in faith, did exactly what Jesus told him to do, and in a moment, he is made well. Do you see the spiritual parallels here? Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Jesus 
says to this man something, the man believes it, Jesus tells him to do something, the man does it, and immediately the man is healed. Do you see the spiritual parallels there? You have a problem. You're sick with sin. You are desperately wicked and rebel against God. You have been your whole life. So have I. You're sick in that sense. You need to be healed, but you can't heal yourself. Just like the man couldn't get in the pool by himself. There's no way for you to be healed. But then all of a sudden, God comes along. He tells you something wonderful, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you believe in that. And then you are told that you must have faith in Christ and repent for the forgiveness of sins. And so then you do that. And guess what? Immediately, you are spiritually healed, just like the man is immediately healed, physically speaking, here. So strong is this parallel. That's not coincidental. The fact of his healing was confirmed that he had the strength. to. He hasn't moved in 38 years. If I lay on the couch for an afternoon, I have to work up a little bit of get-go so that my knees will work and I can get up. This man has moved in 38 years, yet now all of a sudden, miraculously, in a moment, he has the strength to stand up, grab his mat, and walk. This is confirmation of the power of the healing. Jesus told him what to do. He asked no questions. But he got up and he walked. He did what he was told to do because for some reason, he believed in the man who spoke to him. That is the kind of faith that we are called to have. He healed the man beside the pool, but without touching the pool at all. The pool had nothing to do with it. This was to highlight the fact that Jesus could heal without the pool. Jesus didn't need that water. Jesus can heal just by his word. All to highlight this. At the end of this, it says that day was the Sabbath. This miraculous thing that's done, this amazing thing that's done, happens on the Sabbath. This is all done on the Sabbath day will be the source of the controversy that's about to follow. Verse 10 in John 5. This is where the Jews ignore the miracle and take offense. Right? When I'm telling you this story, you people of God who have been saved by him, you get excited, don't you? Because like, you're not focusing on the fact, oh, wait a minute, it was on Sabbath. <laughs> you're not focused on that, are you? You think, oh my gosh, God is so amazing. Oh, Jesus, he's so awesome. Oh, look at all those parallels about how he saves and heals physically, but it's all really just a foreshadow of the spiritual healing that he brings, right? And so that's what you're thinking about. That's what you're focused on. Not the Jews, not, not these people, not the religious leaders. They're not focused on that whatsoever. They're focused on legalism, their own rules, their own man-made ways because all they can think about is that this was done on the sabbath verse 10 in john 5 so the jews said to the man who had been healed it is the sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed but he answered them the man who healed me that man said to me take up your bed and walk they asked him who is the man who said to you take up your bed and walk now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Throughout the gospel, John uses the religious leaders of the Jewish people in the sense um, of that. So when you see the Jews, it's not meaning all Jews. It's in regard to the Jewish leaders, right? That's what it's referring to. Not necessarily just all the Jews in Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem uh, Jews who are the leaders in Jerusalem or in the area that Jesus is at. It's important to... Mark that contextually. And he's not talking about every single Jew that's walking around, but that specific group. It is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. You can't carry your bedroll. Uh, this is a violation of the rabbi's uh, interpretation of the commandments against doing work or business on the Sabbath. You're, you're breaking the rabbinic law that we have established. It's not a breaking of God's law of the Sabbath. There's nowhere in here that you can't carry your Bible on Sabbath. It wasn't breaking of God's law, but the human interpretation of God's law. There's a difference. The rabbis of Jesus' day argued that a man was sinning if he was carrying a needle in his robe on the Sabbath. You're carrying too much. Can you imagine? 
They even argued as to whether he could wear his artificial teeth or even a wooden leg. Because that's work. Carrying something that's not part of your body is work. Sounds crazy, right? We read that and we go, it's crazy. These nut jobs, man, they were crazy back then. Wooden legs, needles in the crazy. We would never do something like that. We would never find ourselves being legalistic in such a way like that. We would never take human interpretation and apply it to God's law and overdo it. We would never do... Jesus always maintained that it is lawful on the Sabbath to do good. That honors God. That's a great litmus test. Who, what I'm about to do, does it glorify God? If it does, great. If it doesn't, you better take a second hard look at that. He ignored the mass, the masses. He, he ignored the human interpretation of God's law, and that's why all of a sudden he comes into conflict with the authorities. You have a devotion to rabbis' interpretation of Sabbath law even today in our time. An example I found is from April 1992. Tenants let three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn to the ground while they tried to ask a rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath would violate Jewish law. Can you imagine? Observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current which is considered a form of work. This is crazy. What about, you know, you're going to break an electrical current when you flip a switch. I mean, how technical are you going to get with this? In the half hour it took for the rabbi to decide, yes, it's fine, go ahead, call the fire department. The fire spread to two neighboring apartments. <laughs> this is just so man. This is so much mankind, isn't it? The Old Testament forbade work on the Sabbath, but it didn't stipulate what work was. Okay? The assumption in Scripture seemed to be that work was one's customary employment. So not carrying your wooden leg around, not calling the fire department because there's a fire in the apartment next door. Uh, none of that. Your, your job, your customary work, your place of employment. But over time, the rabbi's opinion developed into an oral tradition which went beyond the scope of what God's Word said and started to add forbidden activities over and over and over again. Which is how you get to this point of not being able to carry something from one place to another, like a bed or a bed mat. This is why the man is being accused of breaking law, but he's not breaking the Old Testament law. He's breaking this oral tradition, this rabbinic law that was made by man, not by God. So was God mad at this man? No. The rabbis were, because he was breaking the rabbi law, not God's law. It's not permissible. Such hypocrisy. Worried about that instead of whether or not whitewashed tombs, right? Jesus calls them, you whitewashed tombs. Ugh. All clean and sparkly on the outside. Oh, to everybody else, you make yourselves look like you're white and clean, but on the inside, death, full of rotten bones and flesh. This kind of hypocrisy or false um, righteousness is putrid to Christ, putrid to God. He hates it. He is willing to confront this kind of thing all the time. They ask this man who's been healed, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And they didn't want to know who healed him. Do you notice that? They say, oh, you've been crippled for 38 years. This is obviously a work of God. Who healed you so that we might go and speak with this? No. Hey, who told you to carry that bed? See where their focus is? People give away themselves without even realizing it, right? Just in what they say. Where's their focus? They don't want to know who healed the crippled man. They wanted to know who told them to carry a mat on the Sabbath day. So righteous. He probably, this man, this man, he, carried, he was carried to the pool that day and was able to walk home. His life was changed by a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. 
It's a lot more work to be carried to a pool, right? Set down, then picked up, carried back, than it is to grab your bed and walk home after being healed. So their, their, their hypocrisy knows no bounds because really by Jesus healing this man, he is creating less work in the grand picture of things. Because instead of two men to help carry him and all this other work that has to go on, well, the man can now walk himself home, right? So, I mean, these, these man-made laws make no sense. <laughs> they make no sense. To the religious leaders, Jesus was the man who broke the Sabbath. To the healed man, Jesus was the one who made him well. Jesus did not want to remain in the commotion surrounding this healing or the pool because he did not intend to heal the entire multitude. So he withdraws. Verse 14 in John 5. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. So afterward, Jesus found him. So after all this happens, after he talks to the Jews and all this, Jesus comes back and finds him. He, was, he found him because he was concerned for his spiritual well-being. Notice what Jesus says to the man. Right? See, you are well. Go and sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. That's concern for his spiritual condition. Not just, just hey, see, you are well. Make sure you tell everybody who did it. Write songs about me. Throw a couple gold coins or denaries in my pocket if you get a second. Jesus found him because he was concerned for his spiritual health. Not just his physical health. The bigger concern is always spiritual health. Living a life of sin is worse. It will bring you a worse result than being crippled for 38 years. That's what Jesus is saying. Living a life of sin is even worse than being paralyzed for 38 years. Powerful statement. He says, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The, the message here is that sin has inevitable consequences. It's not just mulligans. It's not just whoopsies. There's consequence that comes with it. The scripture makes clear that not all disease is a consequence of sin. Illness at one time or another might be linked or tied to one's uh, moral decisions and what they've done. But there's other times where it's not. I'll give you some examples. John 9, John 9, verses 1 through 3, says this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God's might might be displayed in him. Man did nothing wrong. He's blind because God willed it. So that God's might might be displayed in him. That's the only reason. Now we have the other side of that coin. See, both things can be true. That's one side of the coin. Somebody could be sick and it has nothing to do with sin. But then you have the other side of the coin. That somebody can be sick and it has everything to do with sin. So isn't that nice because it keeps us from judging, doesn't it? You can't assume anything. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 30. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, it's talking about the Lord's Supper, in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, so to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and who drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That sin will bring judgment. Verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Could be that it was sin that caused an illness. Could be that it was just God willfully making it so, so that he could be glorified. His might and power display. Or that you'd be humbled and seek him, because otherwise you wouldn't. See, you have been made well. This is permanent. He doesn't go out and be like, uh, hey, uh, are, you, are you feeling? It's not a question. He doesn't go, uh, hey, are you feeling better? Uh, hey, uh, did, it, did it work? <laughs> he doesn't do that. He, he uses a verb that shows permanence. See, you are made well, exclamation point. Not see, you are made well, 
question mark? No, it's an exclamation point. Again, many things that happened at that pool, no doubt, never lasted very long, but this one would because this was the real deal. It didn't depend on the pool. It depended on Christ. This man's creator healed him. The man departs and tells the Jews that it was Jesus. The fact that he reported Jesus to the authorities showed how intimidated he was. He was so intimidated by these religious leaders. I think Jesus did a wonderful thing for him. What's he do? He repays him by going and telling the religious leaders exactly who he was. <laughs> right? Just shows his intimidation. Doesn't show that he hates Jesus or anything like that. Just shows he's intimidated by these religious leaders. There's uh, penalties for disobedience on the Sabbath. I found one sighting that said, Whoever on the Sabbath bringeth anything in or take anything out from a public place to a private one, if he has done this inadvertently, he has shall sacrifice for his sin. But if he has done it willfully, he shall be cut off and shall be stoned. That means killed. It doesn't just mean like a couple little pebbles in the face. That's death. This is why this man was so intimidated. Verse 16 in John 5. And this was why Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. You want to know who God the Father is? Look to Jesus. You want to know who, what Jesus is like? Look to the Father. The Father is doing something. Jesus certainly is doing it too, because they are one. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. They didn't care. They didn't care that Jesus' miracle was real. They didn't care. All they could think about is that their laws had been violated. All they could see was that their rules were broken. A rule that went beyond Scripture. This is not a, a God's rule. This is a man-made rule. They understood it that if you incited someone to break their laws, that that's worse than breaking it yourself because you're, you're, you're going to compound it. If you break it yourself, that's one breaking of the law. But if you encourage others to break their laws, well, now you've compounded that, right? Right? Because if I tell 30 people to go break the law and 30 people break the law, it's worse than if I just break it by myself. Therefore, they launched this campaign against Jesus, which didn't stop until he was crucified. They had a strange devotion to their own traditions, but no devotion to God. Hypocrites. Fakers. Hypocrite is a faker, an actor. Right? That's what they are. They're not real. They're not really seeking God's will. They're not really seeking God's word. Because if they were, right, they would have reacted differently. The actions always prove out the, the genuineness of someone's profession. Always. There is an absolute devotion to the traditions of man surrounding the Sabbath that you cannot understate. For example, in Deuteronomy 23, it tells Israel to practice good sanitation when their armies are camped. Ancient rabbis applied, applied the same idea to the city of Jerusalem, which they regarded as the camp of the Lord. When this was combined with the Sabbath travel restrictions, it resulted in prohibition from even going to the bathroom on the Sabbath. This is what I mean by you cannot understate it. Right? I hope you can hold it long. The Jews repeatedly persecuted Jesus. They were hostile towards him because Jesus is God. So if you're being hostile towards God, what's that tell you about their faith? That it's false. This is not an isolated incident. It happened all the time with Jesus and them. Jesus didn't break God's law because there was no prohibition of doing good on the Sabbath. God never prohibited doing good on the Sabbath. There's nowhere in the Scripture that's a man-made law. However, Jesus didn't care about the man-made law. He only cared about God's law. <clears throat> Jesus is going to practice healing on the Sabbath, perhaps even to make this kind of statement, to show the error of the religious leaders. leaders. And so he stands clearly against them. Call, if you call someone a hypocrite and they're really a hypocrite, they're going to love you? Are they going to be mad? Mad as all get out, right? Well, they seek to kill him. Not only does it have a physical root, but there's a spiritual root there too. 
Physically, they hate him, but spiritually, you know, man loves darkness more than he loves the light. And Jesus is light. So spiritually, of course, they're going to hate Jesus because light exposes darkness and hypocrisy is darkness. False faith is darkness. Making man's laws an idol is darkness. They did not like Jesus, therefore they did not like God the Father. Jesus says, my father has been working until now and I have been working. He's not trying, he doesn't sit there and say, well, hold on guys, hold on. Let me explain myself here. Uh, it's just a little understanding, misunderstanding here. Uh, no, he doesn't do that. He makes no excuses. He doesn't try to explain that, oh, no, 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 I wasn't really working on the Sabbath. You misunderstood what I did. No, he doesn't say that. He boldly stands and says, well, yeah, of course I did. Of course I'm working on the Sabbath because my father works on the Sabbath. My father's been working until now and I've been working. He boldly explains to the religious leaders that his father worked on the Sabbath and therefore the son will work on the Sabbath. God never stops working. My father and I, my father and I, he, he's, not, he, he's claiming unity there. I and the father are, are one. You could describe it as sonship. He also said that God was his father, which makes himself equal with God. The religious leaders did not miss that. That didn't slide under their radar. They knew clearly what Jesus said, that God was his Father in a unique way, and that he declared himself equal with God. He's, his point here is that whether he broke the Sabbath or not, that God was working continuously, and since Jesus himself is the Son of God, then of course he will be doing the same. I'm like my Father. So I must be, if I'm like God, if I'm like my Father, I must be like God. And if I'm like God, that means I am God. Furthermore, God never wearies. Jesus is perfectly man and perfectly God, so his God portion never wearies. His body, sure. Remember how he rested at the well with the Samaritan woman? Some of the factors that apply to God apply to him. He is God the Father, is Lord of the Sabbath, so is Jesus. God has to sustain the universe, right? So if you sat down and, and took a, a rabbi and said, is God working right now at this very second? Ask him that any time of the day, any time of the year, ask him that. And they'd have to say yes because God's keeping the universe going, right? It's not me, it's not you. So yes, he sustains the universe, so yes, he is constantly working. Let's finish this real quickly. Verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. They understood. I've actually heard pastors, TV pastors and stuff say that Jesus never declared himself God. Jesus never said he was the Savior. He never said that, so Israel should get a pass because he never really declared himself God. Are you kidding me? It's all over the place. I mean, I could... I could Trip over it without looking. It's everywhere. Like, like when your kids play in the room and the toys are everywhere. That's like the statements that God, that Christ makes about being God and equal with God are everywhere. Every I am statement in John, it's everywhere. He was claiming that God was his father in a special sense, saying that he partook of the same nature as his father. That's claiming one ship with God. That's declaring yourself God. That's why they wanted to kill him. Because how dare you? How dare you call yourself God? This was blasphemous to them because then you're making God a perpetrator in your breaking of their rules. Unacceptable. So they hated Jesus and sought to kill him. But of course, God would not let that happen until the time was perfect. God's redemptive plan had a time and a place where he would allow Christ to be arrested falsely judged, crucified, and risen again, all at the perfect time in the perfect way that God had ordained, and this time is not yet. And so even though all this uh, persecution and all this hatred and all this death wishing towards Christ is happening right now, it won't be fulfilled until God says it will and will allow it. That's how awesome our God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the healing that he provides we think of this man at the pool who didn't understand Jesus, didn't really know much of anything. 
but just took Jesus at his word. And by expressing that faith of taking Jesus at his word, he was made well physically. And Lord, may we take Jesus at his word. May we take you at your word, because you and Jesus are one. May we take you at your words that we are made well, spiritually. And Lord, we, we thank you for this, that you are the one with all the power, and that when you heal, you heal completely. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.